All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for watching this talk. So I'll be talking about some joint work with Nima Anari and my advisor, Shayana Vizgaran. And this is on spectral independence and high dimensional expanders and applications to the hardcore model. So the two main problems that we'll be studying in this talk are the sampling problem and the counting problem. So, in this, so you're given a non-negative weight function, mu, on subsets of 1 through n. And in the sampling problem, your goal is to sample a random set s with probability proportional to mu of s. And the counting problem, your goal is to compute the summation of mu of s over all subsets s. Okay? And this is also known as the partition function of the problem. Okay? Now, these two problems are frequently encountered in uh, computer science and machine learning. These are encountered in the context of inference over prob probabilistic graphical models. In statistical physics, these are encountered when you study spin systems in which model gases and particles. And in theoretical computer science and combinatorics, these are encountered, for instance, when you consider independent sets or matchings in a graph. Okay. Now, typically, the counting problem is sharply hard to do exactly. And so we consider the approximate versions of these problems, where for sampling, you are allowed to sample from a distribution which is close to the target distribution. And for counting, you're allowed epsilon multiplicative error. Now, it turns out a beautiful work of Jerem Baliant and Vazirani showed that these two approximation, approximate versions of the problems are actually equivalent to each other. And so throughout, we will just mainly consider the approximate sampling problem. Okay? Now, there's a very natural algorithm based off of uh, the Markov chain Monte Carlo approach, which is known as the Glauber dynamics. And to illustrate it, we consider the independent sets, uh, let's consider the independent sets of this three vertex graph here. So throughout, we'll use these two green and red to mark if a vertex is in or out of the independent set. Okay? So I can collect all the independent sets of this graph as follows. I can get all these five independent sets here. This, this independent set where all vertices are marked red corresponds to the empty set. And this independent set here corresponds to the independent set consisting of just these two vertices. Okay? Now, the approach behind Glauber Dynamics is to just consider all these independent sets and endow the state space with a neighborhood relation. Okay? And specifically, the neighborhood relation that we use is to say that these two, uh, any two independent sets, they are neighbors of each other, if and only if they differ in the status of exactly one vertex. Okay? Now, once you have a neighborhood relation, you can run random walks. You can think of this as a graph in some sense, a graph on all independent sets, an exponentially large graph. And basically, the Glauber dynamics looks, as, looks like the following. You, you start at some independent set S. You pick a uniformly random vertex. And then you resample the color of this vertex with pr some probability, depending on uh, what the colors of its neighbors are, uh, neighbors of this vertex are. Okay, So for instance, if, I have, if I, I'm starting at this independent set and I happen to pick this vertex, then, there is, then you cannot transition, you cannot flip this vertex to be green uh, because its neighbors are green, but you can stay at red. Whereas in this case, uh, if I flip this, ver uh, if I select this vertex, then I can flip it to green or I can keep it at red, okay? Now, the natural out sampling algorithm then is just to run this random walk for some number of t steps and then output the final state. Okay? And to quantify the efficiency of this algorithm, we define the mixing time as just the smallest time t such that the distribution of the Markov chain is close to the target distribution in total variation distance, for instance. Okay? Now, to upper bound this mixing time, uh, researchers often you look at the spectral gap of the associated transition probability matrix of this Markov chain, okay? And so in particular, if you, in order to obtain polynomial time algorithms, it suffices to upper bound this inverse spectral gap by a polynomial in the size of the graph, of this input graph here, okay? And you should think of this spectral gap here as just quantifying expansion or no, the phenomenon of no bottlenecks within this state space with this neighborhood relation. And so the question becomes is, well, under what conditions on mu does the Glauber dynamics mix rapidly? Okay. And this work, we propose one such condition, which we call spectral independence. Okay. And to define spectral independence, we need to first define influences between elements. Okay. Specifically for two elements, i and j, we define the influence of j on i as being this difference of conditional marginal probabilities. Okay. Specifically, the way to think about this is that 
how much can the status of j in or out affect the marginal probability of i being in a random set s sample from u okay now we can collect all these pairwise influences into a matrix an n by n matrix and then we say that mu is spectrally independent if this influence matrix has bounded maximum eigenvalue okay so let's see some examples so in the case where mu is an independent distribution the status of i is completely independent of the status of j and so in this case these marginal conditional marginals are the same and so the influence matrix is, is just the zero matrix okay and so mu is zero any independent distribution is zero spectrally independent okay so this is the best case now let's go to the other extreme so let's say mu assigns one half to these two disjoint sets. Okay. Now, in this case, if I have an i in this set and another j in this set, then knowing the status of i completely determines the status of j. Right? If I know i is in, then I know j must be out. Similarly, if I have two elements i and j within the same set, then knowing i is in forces j to also be in. Okay. And so given this, you can show that the influence matrix of this distribution mu is exactly this matrix of populated by ones and minus ones, okay? And this identity is just to ensure that the influence matrix has zero diagonal, okay? Now with, with this representation, now you can easily see that mu is n minus one spectrally independent. Okay, and so this is really the worst case. And just to show, let me just now mention another class of interesting distributions that have been extensively studied in the literature. And these are negatively correlated distributions. So uh, specifically a distribution is negatively correlated if this marginal probability is larger than this marginal probability. Okay? Basically conditioning on an element to be in can only decrease the probability that other elements are in. Okay? Now to upper bound the largest eigenvalue of the influence matrix, it suffices to upper bound the maximum absolute row sum of this influence matrix. Okay? The summation over all i not equal to j of this absolute value. Okay, okay. Now, if mu is negatively correlated, then the summation of this absolute values is actually the absolute value of the summation. And if you further impose that mu is supported on sets of a fixed size, then you can show that this, this difference here is actually equal to one. Okay. So in particular, negatively correlated homogeneous distributions are one spectrally independent. Now let us strengthen this definition to encompass all conditional distributions, okay? So we say mu is eta zero all the way up to eta n minus two is spectrally independent. If not only is the influence matrix of mu itself have it have bounded maximum eigenvalue, bounded by eta zero, but also every, dis every conditional distribution of mu obtained by conditioning on a single element i to be in or out, its influence matrix has maximum eigenvalue bounded by eta of one and so on. Okay, and our, one of our main results is that if mu is alpha spectrally independent, then the Glauber dynamics has a spectral gap of n to the minus alpha. So in particular, you should think of alpha here as being a constant independent of n. And in that case, you get a uh, inverse polynomial spectral gap, or in other words, polynomial time algorithms. Okay, so now let us see our main application, which is the Harcourt model. So here, uh, the Harcourt distribution is a distribution over independent sets of graph G, where each independent set is weighted by some parameter lambda to the size of the independent set. And the corresponding partition function of mu is just this univariate polynomial, which is a summation of all independent sets of lambda to the size of the independent set. So just, just to give you a quick example, here if, in this graph, we have the empty set. The empty set is always an, in, an independent set and you get lambda to the zero, which is one. You have three independent sets corresponding to the three vertices, and it gives you lambda to the one, which is lambda. And then finally you have this independent set with two vertices, which gives you lambda squared. So altogether, the corresponding partition function here is one plus three lambda plus lambda squared. Now, it is known that exact evaluation of this partition function is actually sharply hard even on very restrictive classes of graphs, okay? And so our, what we do is we use the Glauber dynamics to sample from the hardcore distribution approximately, okay? Now, why would you care about the hardcore model? Now, 
it's used actually to model various uh, particles in a gas. It's also used to model communications and networks. And it also has, exhibits many connections to uh, other spin systems in statistical physics, such as the easing model of magnetism. In theoretical computer science, the Harkin model is interesting because people study the correspondence between statistical physics phase transitions and phase transitions in computational complexity, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Okay. So now let me just mention some prior works for this problem. So throughout, we'll let delta denote the maximum degree of the graph, input graph. And for a long time, it was known that there exists some critical threshold, which is roughly E over delta, such that for lambda above this critical threshold, you do not expect to have efficient algorithms for counting and sampling. And then for lambda below this critical threshold, you do expect to have efficient algorithms, okay? Now this problem of sampling from Harker distribution was first studied in this work of, by Luby and Vigoda in 1997, who showed that for lambda less than one over delta minus three, the Glauber dynamics mixes rapidly. And this was subsequently improved over the years. Um, getting all the way up to the critical threshold, if you assume further structural assumptions on the graph, such as sub-exponential sub volume growth or large girth, okay? But prior to our work, the best known mixing time for the globe, the best known threshold for lambda, for which we have rapid mixing in the Glauber dynamics for any, for arbitrary bounded degree graphs is two over delta minus two, okay? Now on the hardness side, it was already known to Lubin Vigoda in 1997 that for some constant over delta, above lambda above this constant over delta, you do not expect to have efficient approximation algorithms, okay? Basically the intuition here is that for large lambda, the hardcore distribution will put lots of mass on the maximum independent sets, which are hard to approximate. Now over the years, this constant, over, this constant here was also gradually reduced all the way down to E, the, the critical threshold E, uh, in this breakthrough results of Alan Sly in 2010, and with subsequent follow-up works by uh, Sly and Son and many others, okay? Now, let me also just mention that this problem of sampling from the hardcore distribution uh, is also interesting for many uh, special uh, families of graphs, such as trees or planar graphs. And it also forms a really nice uh, test bed for uh, other algorithmic sampling approaches such as correlation decay and polynomial interpolation and others. Okay. Now let me elaborate a little bit more on this complexity phase transition I mentioned earlier. So specifically, uh, on Sly and, and then with and in many follow-up works showed that essentially for any lambda above the critical threshold, there is no efficient algorithm for estimating this uh, partition function on bounded degree graphs unless basically p equals mp. And now there's a matching result by uh, Jor Weitz, who showed that there does exist a deterministic approximation algorithm for approximating uh, this partition function that is efficient whenever lambda is below this critical threshold. Okay. Now, there are two downsides of this result of Weitz. The first is that the, there is an exponential dependence on log of the maximum degree. So in particular, if your graph has uh, unbounded maximum degree, this algorithm is actually not efficient, okay? And the second downside is that, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, the algorithm vice is actually significantly more complicated than to implement than the Glauber dynamics, which is just a very simple Markov chain. Now our main result says that for lambda below this critical threshold, we get rapid mixing in the Glauber dynamics for the hardcore model, okay? And without any additional structural assumptions on the graph, okay? And with uh, uh, ex no exponential dependence on log of the maximum degree. So in particular, we get rapid mixing even for graphs of unbounded degree. And I guess the only slight uh, drawback of our result is that it has a doubly exponential independence on this gap parameter delta as opposed to singly exponential dependence of one, on one over delta in bytes of work. 
However, in follow-up work uh, with uh, Zhong Chenchen and Eric Vergoda, we do manage to bring this down to singly exponential dependence on one of the delta, and we also generalize to many other models. So I refer, I strongly recommend you go see Zhong Chen's talk, which is actually in uh, Fox 2020 on this result. And let me also mention that uh, there were several, a couple works uh, extending our notion of spectral independence to Q colorings of triangle free graphs. Okay. So now let me just summarize uh, our main results, which we show that that the Harker distribution for lambda below the critical threshold is spectrally independent. And then we show that spectrally independent distributions have uh, rapidly mixing Markov uh, Glauber dynamics. Okay. So putting these together gives us the sampling result for hardcore distributions. All right, so now let me just mention, so let me show you basically the rough strategy behind our approach. So the first is we use this notion, this notion of high dimensional expanders to reduce rapid mixing in the Glauber dynamics to spectral expansion of exponentially many quote unquote local random walks where each local random walk corresponds to one, a conditional distribution of mu. Okay. Then we use the, the uh, we show that spectral independence implies spectral expansion of these local random walks. And then finally, we use the correlation decay method to uh, obtain spectral independence. Okay. So now let me just talk very briefly at a high level of, about this arrow here. I'm not gonna define what high dimensional expanders are, but uh, I'll just roughly say that high dimensional expanders are these objects that exhibit a local to global property that's very useful for design and analysis of algorithms. So they're useful for uh, analyzing Markov chains and for sampling algorithms, but also for other, other uh, things in TC TCS, such as PCPs and property testing, um, for analysis of Boolean functions and algorithms for solving constraint satisfaction problems. <clears throat> and then also for building error correcting codes. Basically the rough idea here is that this object called a simplicial complex um, is useful in decomposing a single exponentially large Markov chain, which is the Glauber dynamics, into exponentially many small local Markov chains. So this high dimensional expanders and the simplicial complexes that are studied, they facilitate such a decomposition. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So now I'm not gonna elaborate more on this result. Um, now let me show you how to, how to use spectral independence to obtain spectral expansion of these local random walks. And to do this, let me first, well, define what these local random walks are. So let's first look at the local random walk for distribution mu, okay? So the vertices of this local random walk correspond to partial colorings of a graph. Okay, uh, this, edge should not, this edge should not be here. So these partial colorings, uh, the way to think about them is that, so first I've drawn these partial colorings, I've grouped them in the following way where they have the, a different coloring for the same vertex, okay? So three groups each corresponding to a vertex of the base graph. So you should think of this as being, if I take a partial coloring from each of these groups, then this will form a full coloring of the graph, right? So if I take these three partial colorings, then I'll get this full coloring. And for instance, if I take these three partial colorings, then I'll get this full coloring, right? So these are the, these partial colorings will be the vertices of this local walk, okay? And um, now let me show you what the non-edges of this look of this local walk are. So these non-edges correspond to constraints of the problem, basically. So for instance, these three non-edges correspond to the constraint that any vertex cannot be simultaneously assigned both red and green. And now these two non-edges correspond to the constraint that neighboring vertices cannot both be in the independent set, right? So this vertex is a neighbor of this vertex and so they cannot both be assigned green, okay? So non-edges correspond to constraints of the problem. And then all of the edges are, all the, all the other edges are allowed. 
all the other pairs are allowed as edges. Okay. So this is like the this is the so to speak local graph for mu. But you also have a local graph for each conditional distribution of mu, right? So if I condition this vertex here to be out, then uh, this is the same as looking at the distribution over independent sets of this smaller two vertex graph here, right? And again, we have this constraint because these two vertices are connected by an edge, we have the constraint that these two partial colorings cannot be connected by an edge, okay? And similarly, there's also a local walk or local graph for the conditional distribution where mu is conditioned on the vertex two, the vertex two being out, right? And there's one for every, there's one for every uh, possible conditioning. Okay. Okay. So these local, so I'm only drawing the edges, but I have not described really what the walk looks like, what the transition probabilities of these local walks look like. Okay. So it turns out that the transition probabilities exactly correspond to these conditional marginal marginals. So for instance, the transition probability of going from this partial coloring to this partial coloring is exactly one half because n equals three times the probability of three conditioned on the probability of one, okay, conditioned on one, okay? And similarly for pairs of, you know, uh, red and green and also red and red. Now recall that the influence matrix that we defined earlier is this difference of conditional marginal probabilities, okay? And so what we really show is that the second largest eigenvalue of this local random walk here is exactly equal to one over n minus one to account for this factor times the maximum eigenvalue of this influence matrix. Okay. Um, yeah. So, okay, so that essentially concludes this implication. And now let me, let me mention, discuss briefly how the correlation decay approach uh, can be used to obtain spectral independence bounds, okay? So remember, our goal in spectral independence is to upper bound the maximum eigenvalue of this influence matrix. And that the elements or the entries of this influence matrix are given by this difference of marginal probabilities, okay? And so the maximum eigenvalue of a matrix is always upper bounded by the maximum absolute row sum of the matrix. And so in particular, it suffices to upper bound this total influence of other vertices on a fixed vertex R, okay? So, okay, so now what is correlation decay? Correlation decay says exactly that this marginal difference here, this difference of conditional marginal probabilities is upper bounded by some constant C times something that is exponentially small in a distance between these two vertices, okay? So the intuition here is as follows. So if I have two vertices that are neighbors of each other, then if I know the status of this vertex, if I condition it to be in the independent set, this will force this vertex to be out of the independent set. So in particular, this vertex has a lot of influence on this vertex and vice versa. But the intuition here, or what you wanna say is that if you have vertices that are very far away from each other, then knowing the status of this vertex being in or out of the independent set, does not say much about the, does not affect the status of this vertex very much, okay? And so you can kind of see how if you have such a bound, then you can, then you can upper bound this total influence here, okay? So see the paper for like more, more details on, on how this works. Okay, so roughly speaking, that's how we go from correlation decay to spectral independence, okay? And so, so this again, so let me just remind you, this is the strategy. We have rapid mixing of the Glauber dynamics. We re reduce it using uh, known results in the theory of high dimensional expanders to spectral expansion of these local random walks. We use spectral independence to get spectral expansion of these local random walks. And then we use the correlation decay method to obtain spectral independence. So now let me wrap up by just saying that uh, there are now many other, there are many other methods for obtaining spectral expansion of these local random walks using uh, techniques such as Hodge theory and Oppenheim's trickle-down theorem and also the geometry of polynomials. Uh, 
And in this work, we show that now this is additional technique based on spectral independence and correlation decay. And let me conclude with just uh, future directions. So first is like, what are some new applications of this approach? For instance, could you solve, could you sample common bases of two matroids using this approach? And uh, the second question is like, are there any new methods? Can there be, we should, uh, are there new methods to sort of certify, uh, to bound this lo these local spectral expansion here? Okay, and I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>